In this tutorial, you will learn the basics of the substance model graph as we walk through the creation of a simple bookshelf. As we build the procedural model, we will cover foundational aspects of the model graph such as using primitives, transforms, custom coordinate systems with the basis node, transferring coordinates, duplication, stacking, randomizing UV coordinates, and exposing values. At the end of this video, you should have a solid understanding of working with the substance model graph. We have a lot to cover, so let's get into it. To begin, let's go to File and choose New Substance Model Graph. So now we have a new package and a new substance model graph. I'm going to go ahead and save my package. I'm also going to right click on the graph and just rename it. Okay, so here we have our 3D view and we have our model graph. To start, let's create a primitive. I'll hit the space bar and I'm going to do a search for primitive and I'm going to use the primitive 3D node. So now if I just double click, you can see that we have a primitive in our 3D view. Over here in the properties, we have a primitive type and we can choose different types of primitives. I'm going to be using a cube. So here we have some parameters for things like our width, height, and depth. So I can adjust these values. For example, if I just decrease or increase the width, I have height, and like I said, we have our depth control. Now something else we can do, if we come up here to display, we can enable the axis, which is going to give us our axis handle so we can see the direction. Also, if we come over to display, we can work with either wireframe. So here you can see the wireframe for this primitive. I'm going to turn that off, and then I'm going to come over to display once again and enable my grid. This allows me to see a grid. And as I said, we can adjust these parameters here to set the width, height, and depth for this particular primitive. Now, I would like to probably be able to adjust these values outside of this node, especially if I want to expose those as a user-driven parameter. And I can do that by clicking this first button, which is going to essentially copy the value to a new node. So for example, here for the width, I'll click this button, and you can see here that it creates a new node, which is a float. And now with this node selected, I'll just right click. Let's add a comment. Okay, let's go back to the primitive. Let's do the same thing for the height and the depth. So I'll create a node and let's come over here and right click. Let's add a comment. We'll call this height. And lastly here, we're gonna create uh, a node here for our depth. And let's just add a comment. We'll call this depth. Okay, so now that I have these values outside of the primitive, I'm gonna go ahead and set these values up. The values that we're gonna be working with are going to be entered as centimeter. So for example, I'm going to set my width here to a value of say 94 centimeters. My height is going to be two. And for the depth, I'll go ahead and set this to just 30. Okay, so now I have just a basic plank here in my scene. You'll notice that the grid has disappeared or seems to have disappeared. If we come over here to our wireframe, you can see that, well, our grid is here. It's just changing its size based on the settings that we have here for the overall scale of that primitive. All right, let's go back and just disable that wireframe. Now, something else I want to point out about this primitive. If you select the node, you'll notice up here at the top, there is this output tree path. You have this backslash primitive. The backslash is referring to what we call the scene root. So here from the 3D view, down towards the bottom, if I click the scene browser button, I can now take a look at the scene. And here I can see this primitive appearing in my scene browser. And like I said, that backslash refers to the scene root. So if I wanted to maybe rename this, I could do so here in the output tree path. So for example, let's come over and just call this plank and I'll hit enter. And here you can see that the plank has been renamed in the scene browser. You can actually click in the scene browser. So if we click the plank, you can see that it's going to select the node as a wireframe view, which can be pretty handy. We'll probably use this a bit later on in the video. Okay, so for now, let me just turn off here my scene browser, and I'll just double click to get back here to my primitive 3D view. All right, so the next thing I'd like to take a look at here is the actual edge of this plank. And you can see here that we have just a hard edge mesh. Again, if I take a look here at the wireframe, we have just one large face divided into two triangles. All right, let's go back here, turn off our wireframe, and on the primitive 3D node, we have a control here for our bevel radius. So I can increase this value to essentially just create a nice little bevel here on the 3D shape. Let's go over here to our wireframe so you can really see this. 
If I increase the number of segments and all bevels, we start to get just some increased resolution here. So I'm gonna set this to, let's say, a value of five. And then I also like to go ahead and just increase the number of segments on the width. So I'm gonna set this to a value of, let's say, three. You can see that's dividing that single plane. And I'm gonna do the same thing here on the depth and the height. Okay, so now that I have this set, let's go back here to our wireframe and we can see that we now have this nice little bevel on our primitive. Now, one thing that we're gonna run into, if we come over here to let's say our height, and let me set this to like maybe like a value of say 20. So you can see here that it does increase the height of the primitive, but that bevel basically stays the exact same value. And as I increase or decrease my value, you can see again, like I said, that bevel's not changing. So what I'd like to do is essentially normalize my bevel radius based on my height information. And in order to do that, we're gonna talk about some new nodes that allow us to execute mathematical operations on values. So here in our primitive 3D, like I said, we have this bevel radius and I'd like to be able to normalize this bevel radius based on my height. I'm gonna come over to this second button, which is gonna allow me to create an input pin. So now here in my graph, you can see that I have an input for my bevel radius. Now, let's start to take a look at what we can do here with this height. I'm gonna go ahead and set this back to that default value of two that I wanna work with. Again, you can see that, well, my bevel radius is already off. It's not really what I wanna work with. So what I'd like to do is take a bevel radius and multiply that by half of my height value information. So in order to do that, I'm gonna rely on a node here called the binary operation on float. So here I can select this node. This is gonna give me a value of one and two as inputs. Let's take our height information, plug it into the first value. Now here in the node properties, you can see that we have this operation. I click this drop down, we have different mathematical operations like division, subtraction, multiplication. So in order to get half the height, I could either divide it by two or which I prefer to use is multiplication and multiply that by 0.5. So now I'm getting half the height information. Now I need a float, which is going to represent my bevel radius. I'll hit my space bar. I'll do a search for float and I'll just create a float value. I'm gonna give this a default value of around 0.35. We'll just use this to start. And now what I can do is take this result of this binary operation, which again represents half my height and I can just multiply it by this float value. So here we'll use another binary operation on float. Let's plug in these two values and then make sure that we set this here to multiplication. All right, so now that that is set and we have this information, this is going to represent my bevel radius. Let's take the output and just plug it into that bevel radius input that we created moments ago. And so now you can see that my bevel now changes. If we come over here to the height at a value of two, this 0.35 is the default value that I wanna set for this plank. But as I start to increase the value here, again, let's take this up to something like say 12. Now you can see that as we get a larger height, we get a more smooth bevel. So again, as I start to increase or decrease this value, the bevel is being normalized based on that height value. So with these nodes, let's select them here and I'm gonna go ahead and frame this and we'll just call this bevel radius. Oh, actually we'll call it normalized bevel radius. This little setup allows us to work more non-destructively here in our graph. And I was able to introduce the binary operation on float, which allows us to execute mathematical operations on values. All right, so now that we have this set up, the next thing I'd like to do, oh, let me go back here to my height. I am gonna set this to a value of two. Again, you can see that my bevel radius automatically adjusts. So what I'd like to do now is take this single plank and then start to duplicate it. So a node to do that, let's introduce a new node and it's going to be the array duplication. So we'll create this node here in our graph and it's gonna take a scene as an asset. Well, so far our scene is represented here by this primitive 3D node. So let's plug that into the scene. Now for this node to work, we also need to supply a bounding box and well, we can just use the plank itself as our bounding box. So that's gonna work great. We'll just plug that into the bounding box. Now we'll double click the array duplication and you can see, I'll hit F on the keyboard to focus my 3D view. Sure enough, we do have some duplication happening here. Now by default, the array duplication is duplicating across the X, Y, and Z axes. And you can see that here in the properties. X, Y, and Z all have a value of two. Well, for the X, I'm gonna set this to a value of one. Make sure you set that to one. And the Z will set that to a value of one. Now, if we take a look at our plank, 
we have two planks stacked on top of each other. As I start to increase the duplications in the Y, we're essentially just stacking these planks. That's gonna work pretty well. I'm gonna set this to a value of say six. Now we can come over to the offset and actually start to offset this here by a value. So this is something I'd probably like to control outside the node. So I'm gonna come over to this first button and copy this to a new input node. And I am going to set this to a value of 30. So now if we take a look, we start to get the start here of our bookshelf. Let's right click this node here and create a comment. And I'm just gonna call this offset. Okay, so back on the array duplication, you can see that this duplications and Y parameter is gonna be a great value that we would want to be able to control because it allows us to create the amount of shells in our bookcase here. So what I'm gonna do is just, again, click my copy value to a new node, and let's right click and add a comment on this, and we'll call this shelf amount. So this, once again, gives us a little control that we can work with. Select the node, and we start to adjust the value, and now we have a way to increase or decrease the amount of shelves that we're gonna be working with. I'm gonna just go ahead and default that to a value of six. Now that we have our shelves and we can actually see our grid now, if we zoom in, one of the things I'd like to go ahead and solve right off the bat is that you can see this original plank. It's like sitting at the origin of the grid. So it's not actually sitting on top of the grid. So what I need to do is essentially just offset or move my planks up. And you can see here, because it's basically the plank is in the origin of the grid, you can see that really, I just need to offset this by half the height of my plank. Now we can move objects in our graph by using the transform node. So here we're going to introduce a new node called transform. We'll do a search and we have our transform node. So here you can see for the source, we're gonna start here from that array duplication or actually I'll tell you what, let's actually just perform this transformation right on the primitive itself before we actually duplicate it. So we'll go ahead and just do this offset before. So what I can do is just take the primitive itself and I'll just plug it right here into this source. Now what I'll do is take the result of the transform and I'll plug that into my assets and my bounding box. Now, if we take a look at this transform, we have controls for transformation, rotation, as well as scale. And if we look here, this is going to represent our X, Y, and Z axes. So if we just move this in the Y axis, let's just set it to a value of one, there we go, we've now placed the plank directly here on the floor of the grid. And the reason that one works is because if we look at our height, one is half of two, and that's all we needed to offset by half the plank. Okay, so we could just leave it like this. However, we wanna make sure that we work non-destructively. So we wanna come up with a way that we don't have to basically hard code this value. So I'm gonna set this back to zero. And I'm gonna come over here to my translation. I'm gonna click the second pin, which is just gonna create an input pin for my translation. Now, what we need to do, we need to come up with a way to divide this height by half. Well, we've already seen how that works here with our binary operation. So let's do that again. We'll hit the space bar. We'll grab binary operation on float. And let's plug our height value right here into the input of value one. Now, again, you could use divide. I like to use multiply, and we'll multiply this by 0.5. And now we have half the value. However, you can see that the output of this is green, meaning that it's a float value. But we need to supply translation as a float three value. I'll zoom in here. You can see that the data type for that is float three, so X, Y, Z. So now we're just gonna construct that vector. So I'll hit the space bar, and I'm just gonna start to type in float. And you'll see here there's an option called float to vector three. This is what we wanna use, so we'll create this node. Now, if we look at this, we have three values. We can think of this as X, Y, and Z. And we know we wanna offset in the Y, so let's go ahead and take that float value and just plug it into what will be our Y axis. So our translation is gonna be zero on the X, zero on the Z, and half of whatever the height is of our plank here on the Y. Now we have our float three, which is going to represent our translation. So we can just simply come over here and just plug that right into the transform. You'll notice here in our 3D view, this sets the plank right here on top of the grid. So now depending on whatever the height is, if we change this, it doesn't matter. So for example, if I set this to like say a value of four, you can see that it still rests right on top of the grid. 
And because we've also non-destructively worked with our bevel radius, our bevel will change as well. This is the beauty of being able to work procedurally here with our model creation in Substance Designer. All right, let's come back here to our height, and I'm just going to set this to a value of 2. I'll hit F to frame my 3D view. So at this point, you can see that we've created our primitive. We've broken out some values here for the width, height, and depth. Normalize that bevel radius using a node called binary operation. It lets us execute mathematical operations on nodes. We then uh, use our transform node to supply an offset. And then we created copies of that shelf by using the array duplication node. Now, the next thing we're going to want to do is create a side for the shelf. So if we come over here to our graph, you can see that we have this primitive 3D. That's that original primitive. I'm going to right click and create a comment, and I'm just going to call this shelf plank. Now, I'm going to take this node, and we're going to copy and paste it, and we're going to move it over in this direction here. So we now have a copy of this, and I'm going to use this to create the side of the bookshelf. So if we go back to this array duplication here, I'm just going to double click so we can see that what we're going to want to do is take that new copied primitive 3D and we're going to want to place it here on the side. Now, in order to do that, I'm going to introduce a new node called the basis node. So I'll hit the space bar and we'll do a search and create a basis node. Now, the basis node is quite powerful. It allows me to create a custom coordinate system or a working plane that we can use with transformations and deformations. So for example, here in a 3D program, you can see that I have a shelf. And here on this side, I have a working plane. I can use this grid to create geometry. So for example, I can create a cube on this working plane. And this is precisely the way that we are going to use the basis back in our Substance Model Graph and Designer. All right, so let's take a look at how this works. We have our basis, and what we're going to do is we need an input scene. Let's just use the array duplication, which is going to give us bounding box based on the number of shelves that we have. So we're going to take the output of the array and place that into the basis. Now, if I double-click this basis node, you can see what it creates here. Like I said, this is creating a custom coordinate system. You can see that we have this basis origin as a drop-down where we can choose things like the y max or the y min. So you can see here at the y max value, this custom coordinate system is placed at the top of the bounding box of this array duplication. So a nice trick that we can use to help visualize this, if I hold down the shift key and then left click on a node, that is going to view the node you can see here by the icon as a wireframe. So now we can clearly see that we were able to snap this basis or this coordinate system to the top or the y max value of the bounding box result of this array duplication. Now, like I said, we can jump back here to the basis and let's just choose a different origin. In my case, I'm going to choose the x min, which is now going to basically snap that working plane over here to the side, just like I'd showed previously in a 3D program. Now we can take the new primitive 3D and with this node selected, let me just add a comment and I'm just going to call this plank side, we can now place this primitive 3D onto the custom coordinate system using a new node called the transfer node. So here I'll hit the space bar, let's do a search for transfer, and we're going to use this transfer node. Now for the input scene, we want to use my primitive, and then here for the target, we're going to use this basis, like I said, that working plane or custom coordinate system. We're going to connect that here as the target. Now, if I double click here, the transfer, you can see that it has now snapped that primitive here to the side of that custom working plane. The only problem is it's rotated in the wrong direction, but we could easily fix that with a transform node, just as I've shown previously. So let's do that. We'll hit the space bar and let's grab a transform node. And we're just going to insert this right before, or excuse me, right after the primitive. So we'll put that in as the source. We'll take the result of our transform and plug that into the transfer node. Now, if we left click on the transform node here for the rotation, I think on the Y axis, I can simply just type in 90 and you can see that orientates that plank as we need it to be positioned on the side of our bookshelf. The next problem is you can clearly see that the plank is not extending to the top and bottom of the shelf. 
So in order to fix that, we actually need to make a change here to the width value. So I can hold down the Alt key and then just left click on this width input to basically remove the pin. Now that selected the node. So let me just jump back here to my transfer node, just double click so we can view that. Now what we wanna do, select the primitive 3D, come over to our width input parameter and then make this adjustment. And you can see here that we just need to adjust it so that it will match the top and bottom of our shelf. Of course, we wanna do this non-destructively. So we need to come up with a way to basically measure the bounding box of that array duplication that we have here. Well, lucky us, there's a node that can help us do that. So we'll hit the space bar and I'll start to type in measure and you can see that we have a node specifically for this purpose called measure bounding box. Awesome, let's do that. So we're gonna take the array duplication and plug that into the geometry to measure. That's gonna be our scene. And now you see that we have two outputs here. We have the point minimum and the point maximum. We're gonna to wanna to use the translation information from the point maximum. And that is gonna be the entire bounding box here of the result of that array duplication, basically all of the shelves that we have. However, the issue is, is that you can see this is a float three and here, we need a single float for that width parameter. So we need to come up with a way to convert this information. So what we're gonna do, I'll hit the space bar and I'm gonna start to type in vector and you can see we have an operation here called vector three to float. So we're gonna use this. Okay, so what we wanna do, like I said, is we wanna use or make sure that we're using that point maximum as the translation value. Now we have three float values for the X, Y, and the Z. Now our bookshelf here, you can see this is the Y information. This is what we're actually want to use as our width. So I can now simply take the Y value, which is the middle float, and I can just plug that straight into the width of the primitive 3D for the side plank. Okay, so now when I do that, you can see that it now procedurally makes this connection. Little hard to see, so why don't we do this? I wanna get rid of this wireframe view. So I'm gonna hold down shift and just single left click here in an empty area of my graph. Okay, so that gets rid of that wireframe view. Now, I'd like to be able to take the result here of the transfer and the array duplication, and I need to merge these two together, sort of like a blend node in a substance material graph so that I can view both of these pieces of content together. Well, we have a merge node that lets me do that. So I'll hit the space bar, start to type in merge, and we're gonna grab our merge node. Here's where we're gonna merge the transfer and the array duplication, which is here. And now when I double click the merge, we can now see the side plank and our shelving here all together. And of course you can see that the shelf, the side plank matches with the top and the bottom of the shelf, just like we want. Okay, so what we end up having here, and let me just clean this up a little bit, this is going to end up representing here our side plank. We, of course, we do have one little problem. Let's take a look here at the corner of the shelf. You can see here that we're actually intersecting our geometry. If I drop my display into the wireframe view, you can really see this happening here. So it's basically intersecting. What we need to do now is offset our plank side by half of its height value. So in order to do that, we are going to use our transform node yet again. So here we'll go to display. Let's just turn off that wireframe. And here in our graph, right after the transfer, so here's the transfer, we're gonna use a transform node. So I'll grab a transform node here. Let's view the result of our merge. And let's take our transfer and hook that in as the source. Okay, so to give you an idea, this is always a good way to work. We can look at the transform and we can just try to figure this out manually like this. So we wanna be able to move this on the X axis. I'm just viewing the axis in my scene. So here you can see that we have our X axis is running this way. And so what we'll do is we'll come into our translation on the X and you can see that I can actually make a move of this. Here, let's take this transform and go ahead and integrate it to our merge so that we can see the side plank in context with the actual shelf. So we'll grab the transform and like I said, we can move this. Now we need to move it negatively. So for example, if I set this to say something like negative one, 
you can see that it pushes it outwards. That's what we want to do. Of course, we want to do this procedurally. So what we need to do is just move it essentially by half of the height. So we know that here in this section, we did this earlier, we were able to compute half the height. So here was our half, here was our height value. We ran it through a binary operation where we multiplied that by 0.5. So we're going to do something very similar once again. So I'm going to create a binary operation on float. Let's grab that height information and plug it into value one. And we are going to do a multiplication by 0.5. Now what we'll do is we'll take this node just so we can visually line things up. Let's just move it over here to this direction right near the transformation. And on the transform node, we need to expose the input for our translation. So we'll click the second button, which gives us an input pin. Now we need to construct the vector three for our translation. Hit the space bar and we're gonna do float to vector three. Now we want to feed this data into the X axis. So we're gonna take the result of our binary operation on float and plug that into value one. And then we're gonna take the result of our vector three and plug that into the translation input. Now you'll notice when I do that, it takes the side plank and it actually pushes it in even further. And that's because we actually just need to reverse this value. We need to use a negative. Well, we can just do that simple here on the binary operation on float. So when we multiply this, let's just multiply it by a negative 0.5. So I'll put a negative here, hit enter. And now you can see that that provides the offset that we need to align the side plank with the side of our bookshelf. And if we look at the bottom, you can see that we're all nice and lined up. This is gonna work precisely like we need it to. So now I can just select all of these nodes and I'm just gonna go ahead and frame this. These nodes create the side plank. We'll just do this so we can visually see exactly what we're working with here in our graph. Okay, well, that's all well and good, that worked. However, we're missing an entire side here. So what can we do with this? Well, instead of copying and pasting and going through all this work again, I'm going to introduce us to another node called a stacking node, which is going to allow us to stack or arrange an element with another. So here's how we can use this node. Let's come over here to our graph, and I'm going to do a search here for stacking. And for the assets here, we're going to use the result of that transform. So that's going to be just the side plank. So we're going to plug that into the assets. Now we need a bounding box to stack this to. Well, the bounding box that we can use is now going to be the result here of this merge, which contains our shelves and one side here of the side plank. So now if we just plug this merge here into the stacking and then I double click the stacking, okay, so we get something here. It's acting kind of strange, but what we need to do is just change the side. So it was set to Y max by default. But in my case here, I'm gonna set it to X max. So now you can see that this essentially just takes that plank and we'll say copies it to the other side. So here's one side and here's the other thanks to our stacking node. Now so that we can see everything in relation to each other, let's add another merge node. This is like our combine. So we're gonna merge the result of the stack with the original merge that we had, which already contained that one side. So we'll place these two guys together, double click the result of the merge, and now we have the other side. At this point, we have the overall structure for our bookshelf in place and ready to go. So if we start to look at testing this, if we come over here and let's take a look at that shelf amount, that integer that's feeding into my array duplication and I start to change this. So here, we'll just lower the amount. You can see that the sides are coming along for the ride and they're aligning correctly. We've procedurally built this together. Also, if we come back here to our main width, height, and depth, let's try changing the width. So if we select the width float and I make some changes, you can see that since we have everything hooked up and we've created these linked relationships between our nodes, the side planks and the shelf copies here are all adjusting appropriately and aligning correctly. In the next video, we're going to take a look at adding the back to the shelf, duplicating bookshelves, working with UVs and exposing values.